You are listening to the Adult Sabbath School Lessons for the third quarter of 2022. This is lesson number 12 of the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide in the Crucible with Christ. The lesson is titled Dying Like a Seed and is ready for teaching on September 17. The author is Pastor Gavin Anthony, who was conference president in Iceland when he wrote this series of lessons. Today, your lesson is read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 10. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come again to open your word. And we've been studying about what happens in the difficulties of life. And this week we're going to be looking at how growth can occur as we face difficulties. And Lord, we just thank you that we have this opportunity, that we can be like the seed and we can grow because we die to self and let you become part of our lives. Let you become our lives. And Lord, as we open your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us, particularly in our study of the word, but also in our families, our jobs, our relationship with those around us, in our local churches, and whether we're listening in Samoa or American Samoa or McAllen in Texas or Jamaica or Florida or Ethiopia or Brazil or Botswana or Ukraine and Russia or Adelaide in Australia, Lord, we just thank you that we can put our trust in you and we can ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us this week as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from John chapter 12 and verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But If it dies, it produces much grain. Let's read that again, John 12, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Jesus' picture of a kernel of wheat dying is a fascinating analogy of our submission to God's will. First, there is the falling. The kernel that falls from the wheat stalk has no control over where or how it falls to the ground. It has no control over the ground that surrounds and then presses over it. Second, there is the waiting. As the kernel lies in the earth, it does not know what the future holds. It cannot imagine what life will be like in the future, for it is only a kernel of wheat. Third, there is the dying. The kernel cannot possibly become a wheat stalk unless it gives up its safe, comfortable situation as a kernel. It must die. That is, it must give up what it has always been before, so it may be transformed from a seed into a fruit-bearing plant. And now for the week at a glance, the questions we'll try and answer this week from God's Word. If we know that God's will is best for us, why do we have such a hard time accepting it? What example of submission has Christ left for us? How do you see the analogy of the kernel of wheat as applying to your own life? Sunday, September 11. Submission for Service. Read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 9. What important message is there for us in these verses? Philippians 2, beginning at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name. Contemporary culture 
urges us all to demand and assert our rights. And all this is good and often is the way it should be. But, as with Jesus, the will of God may be for us to give up our rights freely in order to serve the Father in ways that will make an eternal impact for God's kingdom. This process of giving them up may be difficult and uncomfortable, creating the conditions of a crucible. Look at how Jesus did this in Philippians 2, 5-8. These verses describe three steps that Jesus took in submitting himself to the Father's will. And at the beginning, Paul alarmingly reminds us, as you read in the New International Version, in verse 5, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In order to be in a position to save us, Jesus gave us his equality with the Father and moved to earth in the form and limitations of a human being, as you read in verses 6 and 7 who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus did not come as a great and glorious being, but as a servant of other human beings. We read just then in verse 7. As a human servant, Jesus did not live a peaceful and long life, but became obedient to death. He did not even die in a noble and glorious manner. No, he was, as it says in verse 8, obedient to death, even death on a cross. In what areas of life is this example of Jesus a model for us? If rights and equality are good and should be protected, how would you explain the logic of sometimes needing to give them up? Now read Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. In what way does this verse help us to understand the logic of submission to the Father's will? Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And so to finish the day, pray for wisdom from the Holy Spirit, asking... What rights am I holding on to right now that actually might be a barrier to submitting to Jesus' will in serving my family, my church, and those around me? To what extent am I willing to endure discomfort to serve others more effectively? Monday, September 12. Dying comes before knowing God's will. Many Christians sincerely seek to know God's will for their lives. If only I could know God's will for my life, I would sacrifice everything for Him. But even after promising this to God, we still may be confused about what His will is. The reason for this confusion may be found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul is describing how we can know God's will, and he makes an important point. If you want to know what God's will is, you have to sacrifice first. Read Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul writes that we will be able to test and approve what is God's will in verse 2. Let's read the whole two verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, we will be able when the following things happen. 1. We have a true understanding of God's mercy. 
for us in verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Two, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, as we've just read. And three, our minds are renewed. And do not be conformed to this world, in verse 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It is only the renewed mind that truly can understand God's will. But this renewal hinges on our death to self first. It was not enough that Christ simply suffered for us. He had to die. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you any areas in which you are not completely dead. What things does the Holy Spirit need you to give up in order for you to become a living sacrifice for God? When areas of our lives are not completely dead to self, God permits crucibles to bring them to our attention. However, our suffering not only helps us confront our sin, but it also gives us an insight into Jesus giving himself up for us. Elizabeth Elliot writes in Quest for Love, page 182, The surrender of our heart's deepest longing is perhaps as close as we come to an understanding of the cross. Our own experience of crucifixion, though immeasurably less than our Saviour's, nonetheless furnishes us with a chance to begin to know Him in the fellowship of His sufferings. In every form of our own suffering, He calls us to that fellowship. End of quote. And so, to finish the day, read and pray over Romans 12, 1 and 2. Think about the things you need to give up in order to become a sacrifice. How does this help you to understand the sufferings Jesus faced for you on the cross? How can this knowledge help you enter into fellowship with Jesus and his sufferings? Romans 12, beginning at verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Tuesday, September 13. Willingness to listen. Our text for today is 1 Samuel 3, verse 10. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Have you ever heard that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit, but ignored it? Consequently, everything went wrong, and you thought to yourself later, Oh no, why didn't I listen? First Samuel describes the story of an old man and his two wicked sons who didn't listen to the Lord, and the little boy who did. Though there were strong warnings from God, those who needed to change their course didn't. Read their story in First Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, through to chapter 3, verse 18. What contrast is made apparent here between those who listen to God and those who don't? First Samuel chapter 2, beginning at verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. Then he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. And the man said to him, They should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires. He would then answer him, No, but you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. 
Therefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord even as a child wearing a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loam that was given to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah, so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil doings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father, because the Lord desired to kill them. And the child Samuel grew in stature and in favour both with the Lord and men. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when you were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honour your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel my people? Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honour me I will honour, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house, and you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed for ever. And it shall come to pass that every one who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and say, Please put me in one of the priestly positions, that I may eat a piece of bread. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, and before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel. And he asked, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, 
Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of every one who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering for ever. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, Here I am. And he said, What is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. Then Samuel told him everything, and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Eli's sons had other things on their minds than the things of God. And even when Eli, after hearing what God wanted, spoke to his sons, he didn't seem to do anything else. And his sons were obviously not ready to submit the details of their lives to God's will. What a contrast to young Samuel. Preacher Charles Stanley describes how essential it is to cultivate openness to God's voice in what he calls shifting into neutral. He says... In The Wonderful Spirit-Filled Life, page 179 and 180, the Holy Spirit does not speak for the sake of passing along information. He speaks to get a response, and he knows when our agenda has such a large slice of our attention that it is a waste of time to suggest anything to the contrary. When that is the case, he is often silent. He waits for us to become neutral enough to hear and eventually obey. End of quote. So to finish the day, what do you think Stanley means by becoming neutral enough? When you think about your openness to God, what things often prevent you from being neutral enough to hear and eventually obey? What do you need to do in your life to cultivate openness to God's voice and a decisiveness to be obedient to his direction. Wednesday, September 14, Self-Reliance When Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't simply because she doubted God's word. At the heart of the problem was her belief that she had enough wisdom to decide for herself what was good and right. She trusted her own judgment. When we rely on our own judgment as opposed to trusting God's word, we open ourselves up to all sorts of problems. The story of Saul describes his steps to self-reliance and the tragedy that so quickly follows. Samuel anointed Saul as God's king in 1 Samuel 10.1. Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? Then he gave Saul specific instructions in verse 8. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. But Saul disobeyed. Read the next part of the story in 1 Samuel chapter 13 verses 1 to 14. What did Saul do that led to his own downfall? 
1 Samuel chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Saul was thirty years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel forty-two years. Saul chose three thousand men from Israel, two thousand were with him at Michmash, in, and in the hill country of Bethel, and a thousand were with Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land, and he said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philistines. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash east of Beth-Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering just as he finished making the offering. Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw the men were scattering, and that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favour. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's command. There are three steps that led Saul down the road to self-reliance so soon after having been made king. The problem is that none of the steps were that bad in themselves, yet they contained the seeds of tragedy because they were each taken independently of God. Notice the order in which Saul's fall occurred. 1. Saul said, I saw the scattering of his troops and Samuel's absence in verse 11. Let's read verse 11. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, When I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembled at Michmash, Saul was under pressure and he evaluated with his own eyes what was happening. 2. Saul moved from I saw to I said then the Philistines would conquer him, as you read in verse 12. I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favour. What he saw with his own eyes shaped what he said or surmised about the situation. And three, Paul moved from I said to I felt, compelled to offer sacrifice in verse 12. Let's read the complete verse 12. I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favour. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. What Saul thought now shaped his feelings. All of us have done this. We rely on our own human eyesight, which leads us to rely on our own human thinking, which leads us to rely on our own human feelings. And then we act on these feelings. And so to finish the day, why do you think it was so easy for Saul to follow his own judgment, even though he had God's clear instructions still ringing in his ears? If we know that we are so fragile and have such imperfect knowledge, 
Why do we still try to rely on ourselves? What can we do to learn to trust in the Lord's commands more than trusting in ourselves? Thursday, September 15. Substitutes. As we saw yesterday, submission to God's will can be undermined as we rely on our own strength. It also is possible to rely on other substitutes for God. When some people feel depressed, they go shopping for something to make them happy. When some feel inadequate, they pursue fame. When others have difficulties with their spouse, they look for someone else to give them intimacy and excitement. Many of the things we use can relieve the pressure, but they do not necessarily solve the problem or teach us how to handle the situation better the next time. Only supernatural help from God can do that. The problem is that many times we depend on substitutes for God rather than on God himself. Here are three substitutes that we may use instead of God. 1. We use human logic or past experience when we need fresh divine revelation. 2. We block problems from our minds when we need divine solutions. 3. We escape reality and avoid God when we need communion with Him for divine power. Zechariah helps us to focus on what really matters when we are tempted to use substitutes. After many years away, the exiles had finally returned from Babylon and immediately began to rebuild the temple. But there was an incredible amount of opposition to this. Some background can be found in Ezra chapter 4, and right through to chapter 6. So Zechariah came with this message of encouragement to Zerubbabel, who was leading the work. Let's go to Ezra chapter 4, right through to chapter 6, and I'll, I'll pick out the important points. So Ezra chapter 4, and we'll read the first five verses. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because, like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building a temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And then there was later opposition under Xerxes and Artaxerxes. At the beginning of the reign of Xerxes, who read in verse 6, they lodged an accusation against the people of Judah and Jerusalem. And in the days of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Bishlam, Methredath, Tabel, and the rest of his associates wrote a letter to Artaxerxes. And that letter, well, they wrote to the king Artaxerxes in verse 11, from your servants in trans-Euphrates. And they told the story that they were building the temple. And the king sent his reply in verse 17. And in verse 21 we read, Now issue an order to these men to stop work, so that this city will not be rebuilt until I so order. Be careful not to neglect this matter. Why let this threat grow to the detriment of the royal interests? And it says in verse 24, Thus the work of the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And then chapter 5 starts with, Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Ido, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Zodzak, 
Zozadak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. And then there was a copy of a letter that Tatanai, governor of Trans-Euphrates, uh, and his associates uh, sent to King Darius. And it's titled in verse 7, To King Darius, cordial greetings. The king should know that we went to the district of Judah to the temple of the great God. The people are building it with large stones and placing the timber in the walls. The work is being carried on with diligence and is making rapid progress under their direction. We questioned the elders and asked them, Who authorised you to rebuild this temple? and finish it. And they gave their answer that they were the servants of God in verse 11, and they're rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago. However, they said in verse 13, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to rebuild this house of God. And in verse 17, now if it pleases the king, let a search be made in the royal archives of Babylon to see if King Cyrus did in fact issue a decree to rebuild this house of God in Jerusalem. Then let the king send us his decision on the matter. And then we come to chapter 6. Verse 1, King Darius then issued an order and they searched in the archives stored in the treasury of Babylon. A scroll was found in the citadel of Ecbatana in the province of Media, and this was written on it. Memorandum. In the first year of King Cyrus, the king issued a decree concerning the temple of God in Jerusalem. Let the temple be rebuilt as a place to present sacrifices, and let its foundations be laid. It is to be sixty cubits high and sixty cubits wide, with three courses of large stones and one of timbers. The cost are to be paid for by the royal treasury. Also the gold and silver articles of the house of God which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon are to be returned to their places in the temple in Jerusalem. They are to be deposited in the house of God. And then in verse 7, Do not interfere with the work of this temple of God. Let the governor of the Jews and the Jewish elders rebuild this house of God on its site. And verse 8 finishes with, their expenses are to be paid fully out of the royal treasury from the revenues of trans-Euphrates so that the work will not stop. And anything they needed, it says, going on, whether it be food or offerings and whatever, was to be supplied. And verse 11, furthermore, I decree that if anyone defies this edict, a beam is to be pulled from their house and they are to be impaled on it. And for this crime, their house is to be made a pile of rubble. And then there was the completion and dedication of the temple. And we read at the end of verse 14, they finished building the temple according to the command of the God of Israel and the decrees of Cyrus, Darius and Artaxerxes, kings of Persia. The temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. And then they celebrated the Passover. Read this message in Zechariah 4. What does God mean in Zechariah 4 verse 6? How could the completion of a building project be affected by the Holy Spirit? What does this teach us about the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the practical things that we do? Zechariah 4 verse 6. So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty. God did not prevent the opposition to the temple or spare Zerubbabel from the stress of dealing with it. And God will not always protect us from opposition. But when opposition comes, God may use it as a crucible to teach us to depend on Him. And so to finish the day, when stress comes, what's your first reaction? Food? Television? Prayer? Submission to God? What does your answer tell you about yourself and the things you need to learn or to change?
Friday, September 16. Submission to God's will comes as we die to our own desires and ambitions. This opens the way for true service to others. We cannot live for God without becoming sacrifices and living in continual openness to God's voice. For us truly to submit our wills to our Father's will, we must recognise the dangers of relying on ourselves and on substitutes for God's word and power. As submission to God's will is at the heart of a Christ-like life, God may allow crucibles to teach us dependence on Him. Ellen White writes in Child Guidance, page 276, The neglect of Eli is brought plainly before every father and mother in the land. As the result of his unsanctified affection or his unwillingness to do a disagreeable duty, he reaped a harvest of iniquity in his perverse sons. Both the parent who permitted the wickedness and the children who practised it were guilty before God, and he would accept no sacrifice or offering for their transgression. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, as a class, talk about the incredible condescension of the Son of God in coming to earth as a human being in order to die for our sins. What does this tell each of us about what self-sacrifice and self-denial for the good of others means? Though we certainly can't do anything like what Jesus did, the principle is there and should always be before us. In what ways can we, in our own spheres, emulate the kind of submission and self-sacrifice that Jesus showed us at the cross? 2. For many people, submitting to God without knowing what will happen next can be a terrifying thing. How would you counsel people who are relying on themselves rather than God? What would you say to help remove their fears of not knowing or being able to control the future. 3. As a class, spend some time praying for people you know who have difficulty in submitting to God's will, that they may see that trusting God's will is the only route to a lasting peace. At the same time, what practical things can you do for these people to help them see that they can surrender to God and that His way is the best? In other words, how can God use you to help others know of his love and willingness to provide? And for the next eight days, from Friday the 16th of September 2022, the South Queensland Conference in Australia is having its annual camp meeting. And one of my responsibilities is to run the Big Camp Radio 24-7, broadcasting all of the meetings broadcasting music, doing interviews, and generally keeping people up to date with what's happening on the campground. It's a large event, and I really enjoy doing that. And if you happen to be one of the people who listen to this podcast, who are visiting the campground during that week, please come by the radio booth at 90.7 FM and say hi. I'd love to have a chat with you. And may God bless you and the rest of us as we continue serving our God in whatever sphere it is. Inside Story. Our mission story continues with Sibylla reading the next chapter in this amazing story of salvation that we've been reading week by week. Father is Baptized, Part 12 by Andrew McChesney. The day of Father's baptism finally arrived, and he arrived with Mother and Junior at Manaus Central Seventh day Adventist Church, a larger church where the baptism would be held in Manaus, Brazil. About 400 people were seated in the main sanctuary. Pastor Sergio Allen A. Caxeta, President of the Adventist Church's Central Amazon Conference, whose territory includes Manaus, asked Mother how she felt as she and Junior took a seat on the front row. We're fine, she said, smiling happily. The pastor acknowledged feeling uneasy until that very afternoon. Then he had prayed, Lord, please help me. 
I'm not sure about my own strength. I want your peace so I can have the certainty that your power is here when I baptise Eduardo. After the prayer, all doubt had vanished. Ricardo Coleo, pastor of the family's Alpha Community Church, led Father to the second floor, where seats were reserved for Alpha's 300 members. Father greeted Dilma Arroyas dos Santos and her son Clifferson, who first introduced the family to the Adventist Church and the others. Then Pastor Ricardo asked Father to return downstairs to don a baptismal gown. As Father descended the stairs, a man suddenly darted up and rushed toward him. Father turned to look at the man and, as their eyes met, the man's pupils slid up into his head and his eyes went white. Then the man fell down and writhed on the stairs. I've been ordered to kill him, he shrieked. Concealed in a pocket, the man was carrying a small dagger, the type that father once had used to sacrifice animals at the temple. But before the man could pull out the dagger, Pastor Ricardo and several other men lifted him up and led him to a back room where they found the weapon. A short time later, father waded into the baptismal pool. Alpha Church members sang a hymn from the second floor as he went under the water. After Pastor Ricardo told the congregation about the attempted attack and invited a physician, Luisi, up to the front to speak, Luisi, who had examined the attacker in the back room, was a frequent guest at the church but had never committed his life to Jesus. I didn't understand the reality of the great controversy between Christ and Satan until today, he said his voice shaking. I saw it right here. Praise the Lord that nothing had happened. It was God's power, he began to weep. As a cardiologist, I felt for the attacker's pulse, he said. I have never seen anything so abnormal. His pulse was too fast. No human could have such a high pulse rate and live. The experience changed Louise's life and he decided to be baptised. The knife attacker, it turned out, had struggled with satanic possession for some time. The evil spirits left when a pastor gave him Bible studies several months later. Through Father's baptism, at least two souls were led to Jesus. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.